But though the days are not deemed essential, as must be evident both from the principles on which they are appointed and from the practice of the Presbyterian churches, and though they be not sanctioned by direct divine institution, they are not therefore to be treated as unrighteous impositions. They admit of a strong and sufficient vindication. Number one, they are not unwarrantable. No zealous friend of religion will hold that the fourth commandment prohibits the dedication of any portion of our time to the Lord, or enjoins to devote the six days allowed us solely and always to worldly affairs. Free will offerings may certainly still be made of our time, as well as of our substance to the Lord, and such offerings may be made with equal propriety by the church as by individuals. God, by claiming only a seventh portion of our time, hath furnished scope for the native operation of heavenly mindedness and the voluntary manifestation of religion in setting apart to his service what he hath not by previous requisition appropriated to himself. And as such heavenly mindedness might be expected more to prevail under the full effusion of the spirit of adoption in the New Testament age, the laws of requisition on time, which formerly existed, are withdrawn. God deals with his church as if now arrived at the state of majority, when, like persons have attained the years of discretion, she is left to act more freely, and of her own accord to discover an attention to the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of the Father. It would be ill, uh, excuse me, it would ill become the church of her members to take advantage of our freedom from the ancient system of minute arrangements. The liberty now granted is in holy liberty, not a restoration to self and worldly pursuits, or to indifference and carnal ease in regard to our duty. We are left free as to the express divine settlement of many regulations, that the arrangements adopted, the seasonable employment of authorized means, and the intelligent discovery of attention to the mind of God may afford on the face of the Christian world an illustrious display of the full effusion of the Holy Ghost, particularly as the spirit of wisdom and prudence and of the fear of God. Here we are told, that not the dedication of time, even by the church, but the connection established between the days in question and the ordinance of the supper is the ground of offense. No evidence sufficient to prove the connection unwarrantable has yet been adduced. The constancy of it may have given rise to mistakes with some. For these, however, no just occasion has been afforded while the validity of the sacrament dispensed in various communities or received by individuals without the observance of days has never been denied by those who observe them. The people of the Presbyterian persuasion have no ground for supposing that days are accounted essential, or that the constancy of the practice imports any such idea. As to the connection itself, it ought to be remarked that though the Jews were under greater restrictions than we are, we than we are, excuse me, by having a system of specific appointments beyond which it might seem they durst not proceed, yet we find them without divine reprehension, observing days additional to those God had ordained, and that too in connection with one of their solemn feasts. In the history of the Passover kept by Hezekiah and his kingdom, we find that the congregation of Israel kept seven days by way of thanksgiving beside the day of the feast, and the four preparatory days which were of divine institution. For this God did not testify any displeasure against them. A reasoner, such as some who have lately arisen against the observance of days, would have attempted to confound the good king, who hath required this at your hand. And here a footnote, Second Chronicles 30, verse 33, Thompson's Let to Mason, quoted by Anderson, uh, Vind Cant Dom, Appendix, page 310. Let it not be said there is a reverting to Judaism, that by the sacramental days, according to the connection defended, the Christian service is encumbered and a yoke of bondage imposed. The calumny of will worship has been liberally thrown out. An appeal has sometimes been made to the words in which Paul charges the Colossians with a show of wisdom, involuntary sacrifices to which they had no call. Colossians 2, verses 18-20. through 20. And the censure, ye observe days, Galatians 4, verse 10, has been taunting, tauntingly given for a motto on the friends of the Presbyterian method, let any one read the passages and mark what sort of days it is to which the apostle refers. It must be evident that, according to the scope in both epistles, attachment to Jewish observances is specially the subject of blame. If the censures are to be transferred to Christian observances, then we must allow no man to judge us, to perplex or fetter our consciences, or call us to any account, even in regard to the Sabbath days. Thus we shall get more disengaged and attain the spirituality at which some aim with respect to the Sabbath itself. And here a footnote. 
a certain body otherwise respectable in the Christian world, having rejected many arrangements for which the spirit of wisdom and prudence was promised to the church, as having their foundation only in the wisdom of men, speculated a little further, and found that the common mode of observing the Sabbath itself is Jewish. They attempted accordingly in their zeal for the privileges of the New Testament state, and as they excuse me, and as the weak among them were able to bear it, to discard any peculiar attentions to the Sabbath in private. We must beware lest our hatred of Judaism transport us to an unwarrantable length. The Quakers have still more spiritual views of the New Testament state than the Baptists. It is with them the dispensation of the Spirit, re relieving the Church from beggarly elements of every description, that rudiment of this world about which their spiritualizing brethren contend so much, baptism itself not accepted. But as the Christian Church has nothing to do with, this, with the diverse baptisms of the Jews, some for one purpose, some for another, some by sprinkling, others by washing, so neither with the diverse Sabbath days, nor any other holy days and new moons of the Mosaic institution, which, says the Apostle, were a shadow of good things to come. It will not be alleged that the days kept at, that, at the dispensation of the supper are viewed by us in this light, that they either were appointed or ever existed as shadows of good to come. Were any to observe them in this light, supposing it possible, there would then indeed be a reverting to the rudiments of the world and a subjection to carnal cardinal ordinances, but a yoke of bondage is imposed. This language we might hear to we might expect excuse me to hear from a certain class who are ever ready to complain. What a weariness it is, not from those who profess to love the habitation of God's house and the place where his honor dwelleth. The reasoning of some primitive Christians was very different, and certainly preferable in point of the temper it indicated to that of our modern opponents of Judaism. These Christians, understanding the new dispensation to be the good thing, or age of spiritual rest shadowed forth by the Jewish Sabbaths, concluded that God had now, to a certain degree, consecrated all time to himself, and so far from grudging an occasional surrender of some of the days allowed for secular employments, were for this ser were for his service, excuse me, pervading the weak. A portion of every day was devoted to public worship. Their views might be extravagant. But surely the, de the dedication of a part of our time to the Lord cannot render the yoke of Jesus an oppressive burden to a saint. The church, while she submits to that yoke as imposing a claim, even on these voluntary dedications, will always confess it to be easy and light. Nor will any of her genuine children murmur against her authority when righteously exerted in compliance with the claim. We are told, however, by those who press the objection, that the sacramental days are stated, that they are wedded to the supper, and combined with it in all its periodical returns. To join the exercises of fasting or thanksgiving, statedly with any stated part of worship, is to disregard the very thing which makes them a duty, and to tie down to certain periods what the Bible hath tied to no periods. And here a footnote. Mason's Letters on Communion, letter 7, page 180. By Lopping of, therefore, these redundancies of human fancy, this author proposes to attain a more pure and scriptural method of keeping the feast. Page 124. You insist, sir, says Mr. Thompson in his reply, at great length against our fasts as being inconsistent with the nature of that duty, because fasting must be only occasional. Your whole reasoning upon this point is founded on a material error, that is, that communicating is a stated duty, which you always take for granted, but never have proved. Give up with this error. Allow communicating to be as our Savior hath, has indeed left it, an occasional duty. And then fasting will be an exercise occasionally suited to that occasional duty. Whenever you prove your stated periodical times of communicating, sanctioned by the authority of our Lord and His Apostles in the sacred oracles, your reasoning will have some consistency. But till this is done, your vain show of argument is like water spilt on the ground. On this principle, the conduct of the Jews deserves severe reprobation if, as seems to be generally admitted, they annexed to the Feast of Tabernacles a stated exercise of thanksgiving in memory of the deliverance from Sennacherib. On the last and great day of that feast, not one of the seven days of the feast itself, but the eighth, Numbers, 20, uh, Numbers 29, excuse me, the rite of drawing and pouring out water before the Lord founded on the prediction. 
Isaiah 12, verse 4, is said to have been performed. But the appointment was so far from being reprobated by Jesus, who came to sit as a refiner, that on the last, that great day of the feast, he stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Taking the subject of his discourse from the right then performing and appropriating to himself the prophecy on which it was founded. It is observable, too, that though Jesus at the midst of the feast went up to the temple and taught so as to attract admiration, probably taking his subject from the references of the feast itself, yet that discourse is not recorded, whereas the other is preserved.